So now we can have uh, 15 minutes of uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, please use either the microphone or hand us your n uh, notes so that we can accommodate your, your questions. Uh, we are a little bit behind, but that doesn't matter so much because we have a buffer of 15 minutes after the lunch break. So we are actually quite good in time. So uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. My microphone is that active or? So, all right. So uh, let's start with the uh, questions and answers session. Uh, maybe I can, yeah, just, I think the microphone's around. Yeah, and please uh, state your name and which organization you belong to. And maybe in the meantime, please write down qu additional questions and we can collect them. My name is uh, Jorke Grinfen. I'm from Pain Alliance Europe. Um, I do have a question for the ladies who, who talked about the cross-border directive. Um, it was mentioned that uh, the reimbursement is based on the national uh, tariffs which is handled. Wouldn't that be a barrier for the countries where there's a, a low income and a low cost to go to the more developed Western countries and to seek treatment over there? Mm -hmm. Does the Commission know that and are, are they willing to do something about that? Yep. And the second question is for the, for the e-health lady. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, Dr. Pizzo. Is the privacy and the security not a very barrier on all the e-health yeah. issues you mentioned. So in order to accommodate the question, may I ask uh, the, uh, the speakers to come up to the podium because we have the microphones here. It may be a little easier. So for, for Ms. Vasilescu, there is a space right to, the, to my left. And maybe we'll start, since Dr. Pezos already has arrived, with this question. Can, can, can we activate the microphones up up here? So, all right. So they should be working. Is it now better? Do you hear me now? Is this better? Yeah, this. Uh, well, I. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I just would like to say that the price, privacy and security issues are not only relevant for uh, health data, also that is considered as sensitive data. But uh, we have uh, already uh, widely in use uh, electronic uh, systems for banking. So where also the privacy and security uh, uh, rules apply and the data protection rules apply anyway. So uh, I would not see here an uh, additional barrier for health data. Of course, if we would have in place the systems that allow the uh, in one hand, the uh, safe anonymization of data for the creating a database for the research and for the uh, search of uh, valuable information in uh, really quickly and uh, efficiently. Uh, that is uh, one uh, way of uh, considering, but also we should uh, take uh, uh, look carefully into the systems that we apply for identification and authentication for accessing data. For example, uh, uh, that is where we can uh, use the uh, adopted regulation on electronic identification, where uh, people uh, have, uh, the member states have agreed uh, the ways the uh, citizens ca can be identified, and the same system can be used for logging in into the health uh, data, and uh, you can also get an authentication there, what kind of data you have an access, you have right to have an access, and I think that would uh, uh, certainly facilitate for uh, making it all happen because the point here is that this is happening anyway. So if you uh, uh, let's uh, we can say for it, uh, if you can't destroy it, then join it. So we can uh, we we should take the benefit uh, out of it that it can offer. Maybe it, I can just ex extend on it. Um, so the, the the question will be with regard, let's say, to uh, 
teleconsultation. I learned from our telemedicine doctor that usually many people do this via Skype. And, but I, was lear I learned that all the information that is uh, transmitted via Skype belongs to Skype itself. So if you show sensitive medical information to someone, uh, there is no way that you can guarantee privacy here. So uh, would you put uh, uh, regulations in place uh, that regulate, for instance, the data safety of uh, telecommunication? Well, uh, telemedicine is actually one of these uh, items which is highlighted, first of all, in the digital single market when it comes to the question of standardization, for example. This is also very important for our Commissioner Andrew Kaitis, who has uh, brought it up uh, that there should be uh, an agreed approach on this. And, um, uh, well, uh, there is probably nothing that uh, forces you now to use Skype. This is used as an option for uh, consultation. Probably the documents are not shared through, through that system. There uh, can be other ways of sharing and having an access to documents than uh, showing it in, the, uh, in front of the camera in Skype. I think that it is probably very occasional if it has happened. Actually, I do it with my children all the time. If there's a rash in my grandchild, so my daughter calls me up, shows it via Skype and say, what do you think about this rash or something like this? So I think we already use it. So, uh, and and uh, it's, a, it's a nice instrument because I don't have to travel there. I can just uh, say that. So we have to face reality here. Yeah. And people, put this, uh, uh, people sometimes put these photos with rash into Facebook as well. I, I know, I know. We sometimes use it for teaching as well. So, okay, so uh, the, the first question will be... A, Address by Ms. Yes, thank you. I will try to reformulate the question, uh, maybe to refresh our mind. Uh, so if I understand correctly, the question was that the reimbursement of care, of course, is based on national rates, and this may very well uh, usher in new inequalities in access to medical services across the EU. This is the way I understand the question. So it's true um, that the Commission has asked the member states for data on the effects of the directive on the ground. This was in preparation for the implementation report that we published in September. We have included the data that we did receive in this pilot exercise of data collection uh, in the Annex A of the report. You are very much invited to consult the report, which is available online. It's also available on Eurolex, uh, and to look at this Annex A, which contains the data. At this moment in time, um, Anecdotal evidence from member state authorities does not seem to suggest that the directive has had significant impact on the system level. Um, although some countries may have seen an increase in the number of patients seeking cross-border care, that is true. So some countries may have seen an, an increase as a, as a peak in the number of patients seeking cross-border care, but these impacts are likely to be more local than at the systemic level. And to finish the answer to the question, I would like to recall the Article 168 on the Treaty on Functioning of the European Union, which is a very strong subsidiarity article, uh, which says that the member states do retain responsibility for the definition of their health policy and also for the organization and delivery of their health services, and also for the allocation of resources assigned to them. So, indeed, the allocation of resources assigned to their health services is very much in the hands of the member states, and the provisions of the directive are there, of course, um, but then we will see to what extent we can leverage this directive for the benefit of all, not just for the benefit of those willing and wishing to access cross-border care. Thank you. Okay, so uh, one question which uh, came up yesterday in the briefing session is actually which language do you use in order to relate information from one country into the other one? So, uh, uh, Dr. Tinelli, did you already have any ideas? Let's say a patient is seeking medical care in, in Germany. Of course, all the files will usually be done in German, but the patient is returning back to Poland. So how is the, what kind of information in, in which language do I hand out to the patient so that the uh, physician in Poland can take subsequent care of the patient? Well, definitely this is an issue that we had and we 
we discussed in, in our data, we had uh, this sort of issues when comparing the data sets and then the, for the information available. In the evidence that is available, definitely um, English emerged to be the common language in communicative information, but of course there is a need to help people that are not fluent in English and therefore help them in throughout uh, the pathway. So this is uh, definitely a barrier that needs to be addressed with the appropriate uh, tools and definitely internet can be of help in uh, facilitating uh, and accompanying the, the patients throughout the patient journey. But definitely this is an issue. Uh, we, for example, also in the medications prescription, for example, and how these are written and how these, the prescriptions can be um, used across barriers, so uh, this was another issue, and for the, the, the miscommunications the, and the opportunity maybe to go beyond the local language, this is, uh, this is a need that needs to be addressed, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would <coughs> just like to uh, add here, have you translated something in the internet using like Google Translation? Yeah, but the, uh, but you know it also it also depends from which language to which language yeah, you translate. Exactly. Yeah, but for that purpose, <laughs> that is the semantic questions are very important also with regard to this e-health. This how this transfer information would be accessible in another country and that it would be understandable in another language. So that to agree on the terminology that will be used to describe the condition, to describe the treatment, and uh, make it uh, understandable in all languages across the borders. That is one of the tasks, actually, of the e-health network that is established under Article 14 of the Cross-Border Healthcare Directive. And uh, we also have the project uh, on, um, uh, on these semantic issues just uh, uh, now, uh, up and running, uh, which uh, looks into the semantic uh, issues. Before Dieter uh, responds, I may just allude to it because uh, now with the refugees in Berlin, for instance, we sometimes face in one hour 13 nations with 13 different languages. So uh, we actually use uh, Google translational things, otherwise we cannot communicate with the patients and it sort of works. Uh, probably not perfect, but it, it sort of works. So, so probably we'll have to... Uh, uh, the, the EU has to, to, to have, as you said, st standardized semantics, so that translation programs will be safe for the patients and available. Well, based on uh, personal experience in my summer holidays, uh, I can only really say um, this is one point, that is you have, uh, let's say, the medical record that is written then in English, and you go to the doctor or perhaps to a health insurance because you want to have that reimbursement, and this is not possible. They do not accept it. So it is not only that is that uh, this is available, the me medical record, in your language, but it is also the question who pays for that. But, for example, my health insurance says, well, we'll pay, but please present that in German. So uh, who is going to pay that? The patient? Apparently, still an open question here. So uh, um, that gives me the opportunity to uh, hand over to uh, Neil Batteret, who is also uh, the mastermind behind our, uh, our, our, our today's conference. And he's the uh, EU uh, Public Affairs Officer. And I think you have an important question, Neil. Thank you, Gert. Um, maybe, maybe it's for you, Ms. Ms. Vasilescu. I don't know. But um, we've heard about the barriers and, and the hurdles that, that patients face in this difficult process. And they already have to have you know, ongoing engagement with their own member state plus the member state they're seeking care from. And it, so even if it goes quite smoothly, it's quite complicated. And what I'm interested in is what, what are there clear processes for when it doesn't go relatively smoothly? So for example, if the two member states were in dispute over an issue such as um, agreement about um, undue delay or, or prioritization, where would the adjudication come from in, in matters of dispute like that? Would the patient be expected to have a, another relationship then with somebody, for example, in the, in the European Commission? I'm, I don't know. Any answers to this? Can, can the patient go to court somewhere and, and uh, ask for the rights? 
And Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there are appeal mechanisms that are uh, set out in, in the directive. And in fact, the national contact points have an obligation to advise patients on these appeal processes that they can access in case they want to challenge the decision uh, on reimbursement or on prior authorization of their own home authorities. Moreover, uh, the national contact points are also expected to cooperate uh, on the content of invoices. So to clarify the content of invoices amongst each other, uh, this is Article 10.1. Um, there, is, there are indeed mechanisms foreseen by the directive, but I do agree with you and I take your point that what is happening on the ground and what is foreseen in legislation, th th there could be quite a gap there. And the key question is how do we plug that gap? How do we manage to get all the information from the grassroots, from the patient organizations and be able to uh, leverage that into overseeing a good implementation of the directive across the member states? So I think you, you touched a very key point there and indeed uh, I think your contribution is very valuable also in the discussion today to see how we can best uh, leverage this, this information that you have through your organizations and also through your, through your uh, stakeholder groups. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very, very much, uh, all of you, and especially uh, thank the speakers very much. So we have uh, one final question before we have to go into the coffee. Two, two, three, final three final questions. Okay, so please, uh, quick questions and quick answers because uh, I think you all deserve a coffee break of about 15 minutes. So maybe we'll start in the front. Hello, my name is uh, Karen Strangard. I work for Novartis. Um, so to first a point and then a question. So I think in terms of uh, data protection, I think this is hugely important. And I just want to make the point that anonymized data does not have the same usability for, for health research, healthcare provision as pseudonymized data. So there's a, a really a big need to look at, at health data um, in, a, in, a, in its own way. So that's one point. Uh, in terms of getting people to comply with legislation, I think there's been a lot of talk about the, the powers of the commission making member states do it, but I think a lot of the barriers that are there are, for example, the way healthcare systems are funded, how hospitals get funded in countries, maybe they get paid by transactions, you know, maybe they have just one budget and adding another patient can become a burden. So in, in what, I mean, how do you see helping like national or member states in the health systems actually to have systems that are more capable of transferring patients, not just telling them they have to figure it out, but actually the best practice sharing on how can they absorb cross-border uh, health care from a systemic perspective. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, very important question. Um, I will only comment on, on the second part of your question. So uh, to what extent healthcare systems can better cooperate with each other and share best practice. I think this comes very much uh, or harks back at the articles that look at cross-border collaboration, particularly between neighboring countries. Um, and there are a number of projects in the pipeline at the moment, also studies that we have launched. Um, this topic has also been discussed at the informal meeting of, of health ministers in Luxembourg. So there are a lot of internal reflections in order to foster this uh, work around cross-border cooperation and how you, we can best learn from each other. So developing a sort of learning network of national contact points that can share experiences, learn from each other and also make sure that we advance together as a, as a group across the EU. Thank you very much. Second question, second final question. So uh, yes, in the, in the middle section. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Chris Wells and I'm, I'm president of the European Pain Federation. We have 100, 000, 100 million patients throughout Europe with pain. You have 120, 000, 120 million throughout Europe. We have a lot of cross patients uh, which we share. Uh, and I'm fascinated with this whole discussion. Although I do want to tell you, Gert, that I'm an anaesthetist and we have a 99.95% success rate with our professional skills of anaesthesia, better, even better than rheumatology. Um, but uh, what I was thinking was all this information must be available somewhere on a website. And my, my question is, where do we go to get this information so that EULA and EFIC, hopefully, together, can let our healthcare professionals and our patients know where to go for all this information in one place? I, I think that uh, if we get the permission of all the speakers, we will put it on the EULA website so that it will be available. And it's also streamed today, so uh, 
so that a, a lot of it will be will be available. Yeah, but you're right. We probably have to uh, write dossiers or something so so to in, inform the patients about the potentials of of these legislations. Ah, okay. So Twitter is very busy. So this is a good sign. So there was a final or a far yes. Uh, um, so a remark. Yeah. I would just like to add that in my slide, that was not the website where all the information about e-health is available. I will send it to you, okay. and then you can uh, put it on the conference website. So I think final question by Marius Gulumas. I think it's very important to encourage the national contact points to involve the patient organizations in the implementation of the directive, but also to disseminate this to the patients. And also, I would like to say that EULAR, as an umbrella organization representing 37 patient and national organizations, we are very keen to participate in the NECP meeting in December. So I think our input to this meeting will be very important.